huge risk to them. And then, of course, there's the reputational risk. There is the risk uh, that will affect properties and businesses across this region if Irish cement is allowed to do what they want to do. And then if, as in the case that's happened in the last few days in, in Dublin, there is some kind of accident, then the reputation of this region will suffer enormously. And I think what's also a great concern is that over the 80 years that Irish cement have operated in this area, there has really been very little opposition to what they've done. They, of course, have brought jobs into the region and they've done a certain amount of kind of local philanthropy, but they have really not been um, surveillanced and watched in the way that they should have been. And both the HSE and EPA, I don't think, and I think a lot of our own research into their work uh, and into their relationship with Irish Cement would prove the fact that they have been somewhat negligent. There is no real proper data that allows us to assess the levels of uh, health risk to this region. And so it's what, what we're facing is in a way a deficit in local and indeed national governments. Uh, it's more than just taking on the apparatus of a local uh, irresponsible industry. It, it actually reaches much further than that. And of course, Irish cement themselves are owned by CRH, Cement Roadstone Holdings, which is the most powerful company to have emerged out of Ireland uh, in the last 50 years. So in that sense, this is something of a David and Goliath battle, uh, and one that is going to require every citizen of this city to do their bit, essentially, to, to really preserve the health and well-being and the, uh, the purity of the air system uh, as such uh, going forward into the future. Um, the, the main work of LAP has really been to raise awareness. And this evening, we are really honored to have uh, in our presence one of the world's leading authorities on uh, incineration and indeed on alternatives to incineration. Um, the Emeritus Professor Dr. Paul Conant, uh, who was, was actually did his uh, doctoral work uh, in Cambridge, has spent most of his academic life in uh, teaching at a, an outstanding uh, liberal arts college in upstate New York. Uh, but his level of expertise has led him to address the United Nations on a couple of occasions and uh, Paul, would you pass me a book there on the table? And he has also um, written this remarkably important volume on the zero waste solution, which is perhaps the most uh, significant intervention in the whole massive crisis in the global waste uh, of recent years. So uh, in a moment, uh, Dr. Conant is going to address us all with a lecture explaining the dangers, problems, uh, and alternatives to incineration. Um, but before that, we want one of our own voices to say a few words uh, to you all. Uh, Mary Hamill, I, I first met uh, at a meeting at the end of last year. She has now become a very active member of Limerick Against Pollution. Uh, she really does speak about this matter from the heart, and I think um, it's worth listening to her for a few minutes so that she can explain to you her deep concerns as to why we must use every, uh, every piece of um, love that we have to stop this from happening. Thank you. up to 30 kilometres, so all of Limerick would be affected. 
and it would be mostly through the food chain that we would get these harmful chemicals. These chemicals can cause things like hormonal disturbances, inability to maintain pregnancy, birth defects, immune system problems, lung problems, liver and heart problems, and cancer. Similar to me, the members of LAP seem to be ordinary working people, family people, and their sole motivation in digging deeper into the plant virus plant was in the interest of health. They had and had no other agenda. Not one to believe in everything I hear, I did some research myself and also organized a visit to the plant with seven other concerned parents. That was the 18th of January this year. We met with Brian Gilmore, communications manager, and two other staff members of the plant. I put various questions to him. For instance, why Limerick Cement only formed 500 people in and around the Mongrish area, when this proposal affects us all, all of Limerick? Why they refused to have a public meeting? He was very vague with his responses on many of the questions. I asked about training of the, of the Mongrish employees, as they would be moving from handling the current fuel pet coat to handling much more dangerous materials. This was also sketchy, and nothing seemed to have been put in place. The least I would have expected was that staff be sent to spend time in a European well-run incinerator with an impeccable safety record. I asked if Irish Cement Limerick intend to import tyres, as there is a big concern around the introduction of infectious diseases being brought in on these tyres. His answer was, it was not their intention, but there is nothing preventing their tyre supplier from importing tyres. I asked him about the sister plant in Platten, in Platten Drogheda, and how the local people felt about the change in 2011 to alternative fuel. He confirmed all was well, and there was no problems or issues expressed by the people in the area. <coughs> However, I knew this not to be the case. Local people were very concerned about an investigation into the occurrence of a rare syndrome called gillian Barr syndrome. And this investigation was done locally. When I put this to him, his, his response was that nothing had come of the HSC investigation. Nothing had been proven. I expressed concern about using the existing aging kilns, that they're too old, not built for this purpose, that they do not have fatal safe devices. And he said not to worry, that they were well equipped for their new use. I asked him about the serious big blowouts in 2006 and 2015. He advised the first was due to wear and tear, and the second blowout in 2015 was simply down to somebody opening a port that should not have been opened. I replied that this was something you'd expect to see in a scene from Father Ted, and I felt he was quite blasé about the blowouts. I, point, I pointed out I had read their environmental impact statement report and told Mr. Gilmore I was concerned with many aspects. In particular, the section give a list where they give a list of the substances they plan to incinerate. The word etc. appears at the end of each line. Mr. Gilmore's response was that this was put in so that they would not have to apply for a license when introducing even more material to be incinerated. I asked if they would receive payment for the waste, and Mr. Gilmore made no apologies, saying that it makes perfect business sense to receive payment. It became clear to me it was about money and not about reducing carbon emissions. It was shortly after this visit that I became a member of LAP, as I did not feel in any way assured that this proposal was safe. We are even more concerned now, especially with all that has happened in the month of April this year at the Limerick plant. Irish Cement had almost been dragged, kicking and screaming, to eventually admit that the dust finally analysed by the EPA came from their plant. This does not instill confidence that they will come clean in the future. We have met with the Director of Public Health Limerick, Dr May Mannix, and two of our, and two of her staff to express our concerns. They themselves admit that they are not experts in this field, lack adequate knowledge, and have liaised with people with more expertise in Health England. Health England say that CRH, are pro what they are promoting, may work in a well-regulated environment, but the HSC cannot take this advice at face value, as we do not have a regulated environment. Dublin councillor Keno Callahan in response to yesterday's pool bag incident is quoted as saying, we have a poor culture of regulation. If this gets the go-ahead, the responsibility does not lie with any organisation
to measure the health outcomes. Their plant in Drogheda is currently doing what Irish Cement Limerick are proposing to do, and no organisation is currently measuring the increased health risk. I.e. levels of dioxin emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, furon emissions, and food chain risks. It has been reported that Limerick is the worst county for pulmonary disease in Ireland. We certainly do not wish to be known as the worst county for any other diseases. To sum up, I have had two visits to the plant and am not reassured. If this gets the go-ahead and further down the road major health issues present themselves, I want to be able to tell my two boys, niece and nephews, that I tried to do something to stop it. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I do hope we have some people that are for this plot, and I applaud you for coming, if you are for this, so that you can have your say when the time comes, and ask tough questions. Just to introduce myself, I must make a correction. I didn't get my PhD at uh, Cambridge. I got it at Dartmouth in the United States, but I did have my first degree from, from Cambridge. So just to continue my introduction, I'm a retired professor of chemistry, and I specialize in environmental chemistry and toxicology. I first got involved with waste in 85, when they tried to build an incinerator in our northernmost county of New York State, right close to the Canadian border. When I first heard about it, I thought the incineration sounded a good idea. We get rid of the landfills and we create some energy. And then, as I pursued this, I found that burning waste produces the most toxic substance, substances that we've ever made in a chemical laboratory. Between 1985 and 1995, as Director of Work on Waste USA, we helped to stop, help citizens to stop uh, 300 uh, incinerators from being built. And only one incinerator, trash incinerator, has been built in the United States since 1997. Just one. Since uh, 1998, I've promoted zero waste. And it's so nice to be positive, to have a solution which is positive, that people say yes to. They say yes to recycling, yes to reuse, yes to repair, yes to composting, and yes, most important of all, to sustainability. Uh, particularly in Italy, that message has been refined in Italy over the last 20 years. I went there first in 1996. I've since visited Italy another 20, 73 times. The issue has taken me to 49 states in the United States. I've never been to Alaska and 63 other countries. When I started, it was my determination that it, I would not make any money out of this. I didn't need money. I was happy with my professor's salary. Uh, my determination was to act as a consultant pro bono in the public interest and help citizens get the best science unmanipulated by corporate interest. Uh, that's what I've tried to do. I, I'm not saying that I'm right on everything. Like everybody else, I make mistakes. But they're going to be genuine mistakes and you can be absolutely confident that everything I say to you, I believe to be true. I'm not manipulating anything. And I should end at that, should have ended at the corporate interest. I now have to tell you that the governments are not on our side. As you know, in the United States, corporations run America, they run most countries. And unfortunately, you've got agencies like the EPA who are the enemy. They're on the other side. They're literally working for the other side. They have revolving doors where the people that they're regulating come and work for them, and then they leave, they go back and work for industry. I think you know all that. Anyway, the end result of this 30-odd year involvement is, as Angus said, uh, this book, The Zero Waste Solution. And to give it its full title, it's called 
untrashing, a self-tracking book is untrashing this stupid idea. You have to be, and you've got to draw as much blood in the process, and not literally, but pain, so that they never come after you with another stupid proposal like this. So fight like hell is my message. Now the forward to this book was by a more gentle person, uh, Jeremy Irons, as you know, of Phil's he lives uh, in, in Ireland. And he hosted this magnificent movie called Trash. And if you haven't seen this movie yet, you must do. He went around the world uh, documenting some of the dreadful stories about incinerators and landfills and so on. And perhaps the most riveting and disturbing information is what we're doing to the oceans with nine million tons of plastic every year going into the oceans and albatrosses feeding their babies plastic bottle caps and not fish. A, a dramatic and wonderful moment for me was on Saturday, April the 9th, 2016, when I met the Pope and was able to give him a copy of that book. You know, I was, you wait on a long line of people on a, on a fence. You see him coming up and you say, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Obviously, turned him to give him the book. Uh, but what was I going to say? And I did manage two things before we had to move on. One was, thank you, thank you, Pope, for uh, what you're doing to get people interested in the circular economy. And also, I said, in Italy, they're doing wonderful things on zero waste in this book. But what I forgot to say is my, one of my favorite things that I've invented, this, this phrase came to me many years ago, when the only thing they could accuse me of was that I was an environmental evangelist. <laughs> and this is what I came up with. God recycles, the devil, devil burns. <laughs> but I didn't tell the Papa that. <laughs> I should have done. So a few words about sustainability. And quite frankly, if you're not interested in sustainability, much of what I've said is probably going to waste your time. But Here's the problem. We would need five planets if everybody consumed like an American. We'd need two planets if everybody consumed like a European. That's bad enough. But meanwhile, we have India and China copying our consumption patterns. And not only copying our consumption patterns, but copying our disposal um, patterns too. Right now, China is trying to build a 6,000 ton a day trash center. They're trying to build 300 incinerators all over China to add to the dreadful pollution that they already have. So we have to set a better example. And clearly something has got to change. And if I believe the best place to start that change is with waste. Because every day, everyone except the extreme poor are making waste. And all the time they're making waste, they're part of a non-sustainable way of living on this planet. But with good political leadership, especially local political leadership, then they can all be part of a movement towards sustainability. In other words, this is our most concrete connection to the problem and to the solution. It's in our hands, these ten things. But basically, we have to convert a linear economy to a circular economy. Here's the linear economy. It begins with extraction of raw materials. You ship them around the world. You manufacture products, you consume those products, and then you throw it away, waste. And you call development the quicker that you can do that. The more developed you are, the quicker that process is. So in the book, I describe 10 steps to zero waste. It's common sense. Anybody could have worked this out, I believe. Um, 10 steps. And you're doing many of them in Lima. You really are. It's a, you've made a terrific start. It begins with source separation, these 10 things. Secondly, having sorted out, the most important thing you have to sort out is clean organic waste, clean kitchen waste, because we need that back to the soil. We need to feed into organic agriculture. We need Ireland to reject GMOs, reject pesticides, and become world famous for organic agriculture. That is your future, in my view. But to do that, to use the organic waste, the domestic waste stream, you have to get it clean. That's why you need door-to-door -door collection. And then the, the next step, of course, is composting, and one that you're familiar with, recycling. 
you're doing all that. And later on I'm going to be talking about some of the other steps which are perhaps maybe less familiar to you. Now a huge obstacle to achieving zero waste and moving towards sustainability and the circular economy is incineration. And let me explain why. Here are the arguments about against burning waste. It's very expensive. It's very complicated. It creates very few jobs. It's inflexible. It ties your hands for 25 years. It takes 25 years to pay back the capital investment. It puts toxics into the air and toxics into the ash. The better you are protecting the air, the more toxic the ash. It doesn't get rid of landfills. You still need the landfills for the ash. It is not sustainable. It perpetuates the linear economy. And there are better alternatives, which I've already started with. As more and more communities are rejecting incineration, there is a new threat. The use of cement kilns to burn waste. This is very threatening because they're already there. If you try to build an incinerator tomorrow, you'll have a massive opposition to it, and you'll probably win. People get educated. But if the cement kiln is already there, it's not so easy. That's why you are so important, especially the ones who live close to this plant. You're working for all of us. Now, let me explain the difference between zero waste, the, the, the knife edge, the, this, we hinge on this nexus here. The zero waste message to industry is if we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it or compost it, then industry shouldn't be making it. We need better industrial design for the 21st century. Zero waste is a combination of community responsibility, which you've already shown that you're willing to do well, and industrial responsibility. And we have yet to call upon industry. We've assumed that we have to do everything we can't because of some of the stupid crap they produce. Now the cement kiln, on the other hand, this is their message to industry. If society can't reuse it, recycle it, or compost it, don't worry, we will burn it in our kilns and we will save our industry lots of money on fuel and get paid doing it. Of course they want this. There are chief executive officers out there who have said on the record that they expect to be making more money burning waste than making cement. This is the profit. That's what they see. Barrels of gold. Now the question I have for you is Limerick becoming a sacrifice area where you start contaminating and then it gets the notion is it's already polluted, so you bring in another polluter and another uh, savage attack on your environment. <coughs> is Ireland going from green to muddy brown? I mean, I always thought Ireland is green, and certainly from the plane, it's very green. <laughs> the person behind me, just before we landed, said, Woo! She says, Ireland is very, very green. And the person next to us said, yes, that's because it rains every day. <laughs> or even red. And yesterday I had the thrill of meeting Pat and his wife, and they showed me these dreadful red ponds. And today, Mark Ponds, and today with the help of Derek, we, we flew for 55 minutes around this whole region. And what a beautiful country. What a beautiful green country. I'm, I'm looking from the air at the most fertile valley in the whole of Europe. The most fertile valley in the whole of Europe. And you see all those farms out there harvesting their crops and that they're tending the sheep and cattle. And then you see this savage red ponds here, built right next to the estuary, just a few feet from the estuary. It's like some slashing a Renaissance painting. It's like blood. It's blood on your hands. Blood on somebody's hands. Uh, and they say, well, this is not toxic, but Pat, it's making it all up, isn't it? just trying to make money, he's making it all up. Well, I tell you, he's not making it up. And you know how I know? 
Because the first thing the government does when you have a scandal like this, a pollution scandal like this, and the decision to put this crap here, is that they blame the farmer. Anything that happens, they blame the farmer. In Bonnie Scotland, they blamed Andrew Graham for his cattle dying. Not the hazardous waste incinerator. He was a bad husbandry. And yet his animals won prizes before the hazardous waste incinerator. Same thing happened in Pontypool, Wales with another hazardous waste incinerator. And the same thing happened in Utah where the sheep were poisoned, died in thousands. Then it turned out it was a release of nerve gas. And the same thing happened again in Michigan, but they poisoned the whole of Michigan. How? Because, oh, because it was bad farmers. The farmers were doing it. Bad farming. No, what happened is they mixed up fire retardant and animal feed. They looked, they came in the same bags, looked the same, they were side by side, and they fed polybromidated by tramps to the cattle. Not the farmers. Um, little common sense here. How does that, that red dust there, that red stuff, get to his farm? It doesn't seem possible, does it? You see down there, and he's up on the hill somewhere. Well, here's a little experiment. A little experiment in common sense. You put on black wellingtons and cross his fields, and when you got to the end of the field, you look at his black wellingtons, it's got red dust on it. Now, where's that red dust come from? Now, as far as this red mud not being toxic, uh, I urge you to have a look at this. They had an experiment in Western Australia where they spread, deliberately spread, red mud on, on the 40 farms. It was an absolute disaster, and you can read that up. There's the website. It's actually on our website, the fluoridealert.org website. And is it toxic? Well, let's look at this. This is a paper written in... Uh, I can't see the date here. 2014. But overall, the red mud has a lot of hazardous elements, such as arsenic, lead, chromium, and mercury. There is the potential environmental risk in long-term storage of red mud. Right in the heart of your Green Valley, a few hundred meters from a company making powdered milk sent to China. One day the Chinese are going to find out they're not going to be happy about it. Here's another thing. And I'm blowing up a little bit here. Uh, huge, uh, these two kinds of red mud can also be found. The comparison composition shows that the calcium carbonate content in simply red mud is higher. They are red mud has more hazardous elements such as arsenic, lead, and mercury, and both have a high concentration of radioactivity. And that dust is blowing into your fields. There should be a criminal investigation into the people that determined that that facility could go there. And another investigation is to the government officials who continue to allow it to be there. Has the aluminum plant and the red mud storage put Limerick on the slippery slope of becoming a sacrifice area? Well, if the Irish cement plan to burn waste in the cement hill uh, goes ahead, I suggest it is. This will be the second downwards step. Let me say this. You know, when people talk about jobs, everybody wants jobs in the environment. When you get rid of that, everything else goes to pot. Now I'm going to go through the arguments against burning waste in cement kilns. Number one, it's not sustainable. Let me explain. Look, here it is. There's that linear economy again. If you burn the waste, all those materials, all those products that you burn, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning and make them all over again. Which means you've got to extract more raw materials, you've got to transport, you've got to manufacture, back to square one. You haven't moved a step towards sustainability. When you burn your discarded materials, we do not mitigate the global impacts of extraction, manufacture, or transport. Incineration in cement kilns is business as usual 
when our planet cannot afford business as usual. We're talking about all the energy you use, we're talking about the solid waste, uh, the air pollution, the water pollution, at both extraction and manufacture. Look at that word solid waste. Solid waste from manufacturing. What have you got in those red mud ponds? This is a classic example of the enormous amount of waste you produce in manufacturing from raw materials. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good news. When you recycle materials back to industry, you cut out all the impacts of extraction and the impacts of transporting what you've extracted from source to home. So yes, there is a mitigation of global impacts. Better still, if you reuse the whole object, you cut out the impacts of both extraction and manufacture. So reuse is a lot better than recycling, if you can do it. And then organics. Every time that you can or compost and get that material back into the soil, you're saving an enormous amount of money and energy from not using a certain amount of fertilizers. And there's so many other reasons to compost. But you're doing it. This is good. It's a waste of energy. Oh, I mean, this is, this is where it gets a bit ironic. They call these facilities, incinerators, waste to energy facilities. But actually, they are a waste of energy. Far more energy is saved the globe by reusing, recycling, and composting. That's where the energy is saved four times more. Uh, what you cannot get back when you burn stuff, what you can't get back is the embedded energy. The energy you've used in extraction, the energy you've used in transport, the energy you've used in manufacture cannot come back to you by burning. All you get when you burn is a little bit, 25% of, no, actually more in the cement film, maybe 75% of the calorific value in your paper and plastics. But it's a waste of, of energy. Let's have a look at this chart here. This compares the amount of energy you get if you recycle the ton of this material on the left. The yellow column is how much energy you would get if you use an incinerator to make electricity. And notice that the one I've outlined, PET, polyethylene terephthalate, common plastic, plastic, plastic bottles. Uh, 26 times more energy is saved by recycling that material than, than burning it and producing electricity. Uh, incineration is a threat to the health of cement cells, the health of the local residents. That's why most of you are here, I'm sure. Here are two technical documents that represent the spectrum of, of views on the health issues. Here's one that says they're very dangerous and a big threat to health. This is by Clevenger and somebody else, Cairns. It's quite old, 1990. And here is uh, the view of industry. And to be fair to yourself, you should read both sides. Uh, come to agree with the judgment. Now, what is clear is that uh, incineration and cement kilns put toxic metals into the air. The, the metals that go in there into the air, mercury, cadmium, lead, thallium. These are low melting point metals and they are easily vaporized or come out as very tiny particles. So this is a big issue. So looking at the toxic metals, well, here's the schematic of a cement kiln. And so the first concern is what is going up into the air? How much of these volatile metals go into the air? And to ask that question, you say, well, how sophisticated is the air pollution control equipment? And the air pollution control equipment for making cement is pretty crude. An electrostatic precipitator. These, these went out of favor as far as a modern trash incinerator many years ago. So they are going to go into the air, period. But it's worse. If you notice the small print underneath the electrostatic precipitator towards the top, it says dust 
recycling. Dust recycling. Instead of doing the obvious thing, which is once you've captured these toxic substances and you've got them in this ash, then you sequester the ash. You find a safe place to put the ash. You may even stabilize it beforehand. That's what you do. You, you, you've got a sink. You've captured these toxic metals. Well done. Now look after it. But what do they do? They put it back into the process. They call it ash recycling. It's, it's an insult to the word recycling to call this recycling. They, put, they completely subvert the whole mission of a pollution control device. So there's only two places now where those toxic metals can go. Either into the cement or into the air. There's no other place for it because you haven't taken the sink that you've created and put that in a safe place. So let's talk about the ash, while we're talking about the ash. There's two kinds of ash that are produced in an incinerator. Bottom ash, which falls through the grate, and fly ash, which is captured in the air pollution control devices. And to, to show you how much more seriously the incinerator industry is about this process than the cement kilns are, more money is spent on the air pollution control than the rest of the, the technology put together. Most of your money spent on a modern trash incinerator goes into air pollution control device. But the cement kiln, they just put it back into the cement. To show you how toxic the fly ash, in Germany and Switzerland, they put the fly ash into nylon bags and put those into salt mines. That's the same thing they do, as they do with low-level radioactive waste in, in Germany. In Japan, some of the incinerators vitrify the ash, make it into a glass. Now, we have a letter, or at least uh, Claire has a letter. She asked what Irish cement was going to do with the, with the flyers to the show. And the answer from Irish cement is as follows. The cement factory does not produce fly, fly ash. In other words, I mean, one way of interpreting that is they don't have any air pollution control device, because if you have an air pollution control device, you better get some fly ash, otherwise the funny thing is useless. And he goes on, the best way to explain it is to consider the purpose of a cement factory and the purpose of an incinerator. The purpose of an incinerator is to destroy waste, which it does at high temperature, leaving behind the ash. The ash, now here, when he says that, he's talking about bottom ash. But the question is what you do with fly ash. I'm a bit worried now because if one of your people is making public statements does not know the difference between bottom ash and fly ash, we have a real problem. The ash that remains is, this is the bottom ash now, the ash that remains is the inorganic or the mineral fraction of the waste that do not burn and is typically sent off site for further processing or treatment. Correct. Now, the purpose of a cement factory it's just that. It is a factory making cement. A hundred percent of our raw materials are minerals from the natural rock. These minerals provide the chemistry for our final cement. They already exist inside the natural rock, and the job of our factory is to rearrange these minerals into a new form that ensures a more consistent and predictable performance when the cement is used to make concrete. Okay? Nice. These minerals from the rock do not burn, but at extreme temperatures inside our cement kiln, they melt. And the ash or minerals from the combustion of the fuel, now he's talking about the bottom ash, but of course it will also include the fly ash, because they recycle the fly ash as well, back into the kiln. Whether from fossil or alternative fuels, which is generated at these extreme temperatures inside the cement kiln, also melts and fuses with our raw materials to become part of our clinker. Approximately 1% of our raw materials arises in this way from the ash in the fuel. In other words, all the toxic elements that are used in all the commercial products that end up in our lives and that end up shredded and pushed into this incinerator 
are going to end up in the cement, or worse, into the air. None of it is tracked. None of it is sequestered. None of it is looked after like responsible incinerators. Now, talking about the, the dioxin problem, I have more to say about that a bit later. The emissions of dioxin in cement kilns, even within a few hours, can change by a factor of 80. And of course, these dioxin emissions will go into the air because that electrostatic precipitate is not going to remove very many of them. They're not using activated charcoal to scavenge the dioxins, and they're not using particular control that's going to get most of those dioxins. These emissions will increase with upset conditions and during startup and shutdown. You need continuous sampling. I don't know what the cycling, uh, the, the monitoring regime is for this factory. I don't know if there's anybody that's independently making measurements of dioxin or toxic methods. I don't know. Uh, I've heard that the EPA uh, uh, lets them know when they're coming. Uh, they monitor themselves, I'm told. This is ridiculous. Measurements made under ideal conditions and by the company, no. You need independent monitoring. It's misleading to compare the concentrations of dioxin, etc., with other combustion sources because of the huge volume of gases that come through these things. It's a huge volume. So if you only look at concentration, you're missing the point. What is the total quantity of toxic material that's coming out of the stack? How much dioxin? How much toxic metals? Um, if you can't get continuous two-week sampling, that's the so-called AMESA system which is commercially available. That's the idea. Uh, so we've got to find out what their system is of monitoring. What we need is a, a two-week monitoring. You put in a probe, you collect a sample for two weeks. Then you put another probe in and collect another sample for two weeks. And you do that for 52 weeks. 26 measurements. And from that you can gauge your total output. This is commercially available, it's used in Germany and in Belgium. Oh, and the other thing, if you can't get that, and in addition to that, I would say, you need to monitor the environment. You need to carefully monitor cow's milk for dioxin. An absolute must in the area. If there's no problem, you shouldn't see any increase in dioxin in the, in the cow's milk. And you should also do the same for mother's milk, particularly mother's milk that live very close to that facility. And that's quite expensive, but it's an absolute minimum if you want to do something as silly as burning waste in a cement kiln. This is what the price you're going to have to pay. The other thing you could do, which is a lot cheaper, is to monitor um, metals in children's hair, in hair. And that's cheap, maybe 25 to 50 dollars a shot to measure the complete metal uh, analysis of children's hair in the, in the area. And there's another thing you can do, which would be ideal in this area, because I've seen you've got moss and lichens on all your rocks. Moss and lichens are very good scavengers for mercury. And so you need to collect those, the moss, get a baseline data, and see how that mercury changes with time in the moss and lichens near the, the plant. And these things I'm telling you now are things that you can do as a, as a community. It, you don't want to have to do this. You don't want them to burn the waste. But if they do do it, you need some defense. Some defense which is going to stand up in a court of law and in the court of public. So again, in, in cement kilns, both the bottom ash and this one, the, both the bottom ash and the fly ash is going into the cement. Now a few more words about other pollutants. The, the new compounds that are uh, produced in the burning process, dioxins and furans, related compounds. You are hostage to how well the plant is run. From what we've heard already from Mary and others, it doesn't look too good on that front. They're hostage. Secondly, how well is the plant monitored? And from what I've seen, they don't seem to be very, very forthcoming on how they are monitoring it, how they plan to monitor it. And lastly, how aggressively your government enforces regulations. And that's where people usually grow. 
You need three things to protect the public from emissions from any burning source. You need strong regulations, you need adequate monitoring, and you need tough enforcement. If any one of those three is weak, then you are not protected. Let me say it again. If any one of those is weak, you and your family and your community is not protected. And the way you go forward under those circumstances is not to allow this practice to go forward. Use every political string that you can pull. Now, as far as monitoring is concerned, there are some things that we can monitor and regulate. There are other things which we can't actually do that physically. Um, there is no monitoring of nanoparticles. These are particles less than what, one micron. They're very tiny, and that's where a lot of your toxic metals and dioxins are going to be on those tiny particles. Uh, the regulations, the regulations for incinerators is 10 microns. That's what they regulate. And it may go down to 2.5 microns in some countries. But the particles that we're concerned about are these nanoparticles. These are literally the most toxic thing that comes out of an incinerator. And here's some of the problems. Nanoparticles are not efficiently captured by air pollution control devices, certainly not electrostatic precipitators. Uh, they travel long distances, and I looked from that plane today, and you see how flat, how it was stretched for miles. You've got mountains at the very edge which will track everything in the bowl under certain circumstances. These particles are so tiny, they remain suspended. They don't go to ground by gravity. They're so tiny, they go to ground by a phenomenon called Brownian motion. So they remain suspended for a long time. And they penetrate deep into the lungs, these tiny particles. But worse than that, they are so small, they evade the first defense of the body. They go through any membrane. These particles are so tiny, they squeeze between the proteins and lipids which make up the membrane, both in the lung membrane and the gastrointestinal tract. So within a microsecond, these particles are in your bloodstream and they are circulating to every tissue in the body. And here is a particle in brain tissue, brain tissue. Now, if you want to pursue this further in terms of technology, how they produce, uh, and also in terms of health, there's two sources I would recommend. There's a paper by Stefania Cormier, an environmental health perspective from 2006. A very important paper. And Vivian Howard, who lives in Coleraine in Northern Ireland, testified in the Rima Skinny uh, Waste Energy Facility, a brilliant 30 page presentation on the relationship between dioxins and health and incineration. And I have seen no scientific response from the industry to either Cormier's paper or Howard's uh, presentation. Very important. If anybody wants Howard's paper, it's on my laptop. I can share it with you if you have a thumb drive, or I can send it to you if you give me your email. Now, here's another issue. As you know, the stuff that comes out of these long uh, cylinders, these rotating kilns, uh, is clinker, lumps, lumps of the what will build will become cement. But what you have to do when you've got those lumps is to grind them down to a fine dust. And of course that fine dust is going to be highly toxic if you're using waste to make the cement. Now we know from facilities, depending upon their their the quality of their housekeeping, that dust gets into workers' lungs, it gets onto their clothes and skin, and into the surrounding environment. They can take it back to their families when they bring their clothes back. And if you've ever visited the cement kiln, uh, perhaps you can confirm this, but in my experience, when you get close to the incinerator, you'll see dust. You'll see dust on leaves, on trees, on pavements, on windshields, and so on. Now, what you've got to remember is you're breathing that dust if you live locally, and that dust is going to be toxic if they use waste as a fuel. Now, I'm opposed to waste incineration 
in purpose-built facilities. I'm the president. So even if you came to me with the best incinerator that you could find, I would still fight it. But I've got to say, this is a different, this takes the issue one step uh, different. When you burn the waste in cement kilns, you are taking it out of the hands of professionals and giving it to amateurs. And I don't mean to be unkind by that. The people that run cement kilns, their job is to make cement. He told you that. Their job is to make cement. They have little experience of handling waste and little knowledge of the exquisite toxicity of something like dioxin, which is toxic at parts per trillion levels. So your engineers that run these things have no idea. For them, a part per million would be good. But a part per trillion is a million times smaller than a part per million. And that's what you've got to control for. That's what the professionals try to do. This is good business for the cement company, the company but it's not good for the health of the community. As I've already mentioned, instead of paying for their fuel, someone is going to pay them to take the fuel. What a deal! And the more toxic that waste is, the more they will get paid. So the economic reality is that there would be, if they're only interested in money and greed, then the push will be to eventually make this a hazardous, receiving hazardous waste. Even as it is, they're talking about solvents, they're talking about tires and, and household waste, which contains a lot of toxins. Now, it's one thing, I know the workers are concerned here about the possibility of losing jobs. But it's one thing for workers to take risks with their own health. It's quite another thing if the bargain is that they have to risk their children's health and their grandchildren's health. That's a different different gamble for the workers. And I want to explain what I'm talking about here. What are the major health concerns of dioxin? Dioxins accumulate in animal fat. This is a calculation that I did with Tom Webster in 1987. One liter of cow's milk gives you as much dioxin as breathing the air next to the cow for eight months. Eight months of breathing. You don't have to live near the cement kiln to get the dioxin. You just have to eat food that's produced uh, close to the facility, even this over the whole valley, maybe. A German study found this. In one day, a grazing cow puts as much dioxin into its body as a human being would get in 14 years of breathing. In other words, if you were prepared for this boring life, you'd have to stand in that field with the grazing cow for 14 months and breathe the air to get the same amount of dioxin that that cow would get in one day. You see, this is something to bear in mind. We normally protect ourselves from facilities like this with stacks, chimneys. What's the purpose? To dilute, to disperse. What does nature do? It reconcentrates. It reconcentrates mercury in fish. It reconcentrates dioxin in animal fat, in beef, in cows, in, in goats, in sheep, in rabbits, in chickens. Reconcentrates. Dioxin steadily accumulate in human body fat. Now the man cannot get rid of dioxin. It steadily accumulates in his body over a whole lifetime. If you measure it, you'll see the dioxin levels going up over 70 or 80 years. But a woman can get rid of the dioxin in her fat by having a baby. If she has a baby, she, the, the dioxin that she's accumulated for 20, 21, 25 years moves to the fetus in nine months comes out of the body fat and it is given to the, the fetus. So the fetus gets the highest dose of dioxin of any uh, age range in our society. And when the baby is born, then the mother continues to give the dioxin to her baby through her breast milk. Now this was so serious. Um, well, at first let me explain why it's serious. Dioxin interferes with six different hormonal systems. 
It interferes with thyroid hormones, which means it can impact intellectual development. It interferes with sex hormones and means it can interfere with sexual development. Uh, Linda Birnbaum wrote this article in 1995 which goes into all the developmental problems that dioxin can cause. In a language it's easier to understand, Theo Coburn, who passed away a couple of years ago, wrote this book, A Stolen Future. It goes into the whole issue of endocrine disruption and why it's such a threat to the future. It's such a threat that the Institute of Medicine in the United States came up with a plan to reduce dioxin in the food supply, or in our bodies, to strategies to decrease exposure. They wrote, fetuses and breastfeeding infants may be at particular risk from exposure to dioxin-like compounds due to their potential to cause adverse neurodevelopmental, neurobehavioral, and immune system effects in developing systems. Their recommendation, the committee recommends that the government place a high public health priority on reducing dioxin-like compound intakes by girls and young women in the years well before pregnancy. Don't wait for the girl to be pregnant and having a baby when you start reducing your exposure, stop getting exposure to, to dioxin. And to do this, they recommended substituting low fat or skim milk for whole milk and foods lower in animal fat. Now, this is surely, surely draconian to get to the point of saying that half the population should change its diet dramatically to reduce um, fat from, from animals. It's pretty draconian. And we are brought to this level because of the past generations that built incinerators everywhere. <coughs> and that's what we have to stop. We have to learn from our past mistakes and don't build these damn things anymore. But even if we made incinerators or cement kilns burning waste safe, we would never make them sensible. Incineration is attempting to perfect a bad idea. Our task in the 21st century is not to find better ways to destroy discarded materials, but to stop making packaging and products that have to be destroyed. We'll give a wrap at the end, and it's just for people who are giving, giving tickets on the way for to, to win a copy of Mr. Khan's book. Okay. jobs and you know they, they, they'll obviously have an argument they'll obviously have an argument for for why they're doing this and the benefits they bring to the city um, and bringing to you know Ireland in the economy they'll talk about jobs and you know I'm just wondering about the idea of contacting the business businesses that will be affected by this you mentioned for example the dairy industry farming industry, the tourist industry, and I'm sure there's many others, you could probably give us a list. Um, are, are these people aware of the effects and the damage that the cement factory and what they're doing will be um, doing, to, uh, doing to their business? And, you know, I'm sure an approach would be to actually, uh, you know, inform them and alert them to what's going on. No, that is a... Oh, okay. Because we're going to take, we're going to take a few. Oh, we're going to take a few. Okay. But meanwhile, so I've taken a note of that question. Is there any? There's a gentleman over here, and and chap behind him in the blue jacket as well. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I don't know whether anybody's aware here that we have stopped two incinerators here in County Limerick. Uh, one of them was on the Dock Road, I had a terrible battle with it, and the other one was at Precora. And uh, we won in both cases. 
It was a very, very difficult thing. And Doctor, it's wonderful to hear you up there talking the things that I was talking in those days, and that's a long time ago. Uh, I, the, the, the thing, actually, I had several life-threatening things. One fellow came up to me with a knife to slip my head, to slip my throat, because I was fighting. So we are up against a big battle. The tough people is these uh, industrious Willie O'D. will remember uh, the battle we had. And uh, <laughs> I don't know which side he was on as well. Uh, so one question I was asked, you said you stopped 300 in America. We've stopped two here in Limerick, and now we're fighting the third. Uh, could you say how you stopped the three and only let one through? We don't want to let this one through. Yeah. I want to make it clear that I've never stopped an incinerator in my life, me personally. The role of myself and other experts it's best understood like this. Affecting change is like driving a nail through a piece of wood. The expert sharpens the nail, gives the citizens ammunition. But we cannot push that nail through the piece of wood. You need the hammer of public opinion to drive that nail home. So that's the function I have to, to arm you, to give you as much information as I can. But you've got to use it. It, I will not be able to persuade your government or anybody with power to do this. It's got, they've got to see uh, a community organized and mobilized, and they've got to know that you are going to give them a lot of problems in the future if they don't help you. Um, it's, and and I, I must say that you've got a wonderful team here. I, I, was, I had dinner last night with Angus wasn't there, but everybody, most of the organizers were there. Really impressive. You've got a great cross-section of the community in terms of age, in terms of sex, in terms of, of skills, experience. You've got a great organizing team. And with the number of people that you have in this room, as you know, if you have got this many at your meetings, you would have been pleased. Uh, you can do it. You really can do it. And I stand by to to help in any way I can. Okay, from a from a far. Okay. Um, well, maybe we'll yeah. see, see as we answer the second question. We answer this gentleman's. Um, then I guess the gentleman in the blue uh, over here is next, and then this man, the, the man beard, and this kid, as well as indicated. Is that Jack Sullivan? Is that Jack Sullivan? No. No. Okay. No. No. Sorry. Okay, your question is great, absolutely key strategy. I remember when I've been to Ireland a dozen times with me, and, and many times I've met with farmers, they are key. The agricultural industry has the most to lose with this. We need to meet with them. You, this is where your power is going to be powerful. The tourist industry, absolutely. The fishing industry, um, and clean industries. Clean industries that want to live in a clean environment. Uh, and there are, you know, some of the best things in zero waste are happening in industry. There are progressive companies like uh, Xerox. Xerox is recovering 95% of the materials in the machines. They're doing it in Don Pork. They're doing it in Venray, Netherlands. So there are good industries out there. You want clean industries here, clean ones that are compatible with the two, the tourism and agriculture. But meanwhile, that's where the fleck your muscles. Because the politicians, one, they can count. But boy, they count even more if you've got a few industries in there as well. Why are this here What's that? Why, what, do they just not know about this? Uh, you know, we, we don't know. <laughs> Uh, the important thing is, this has been captured on videotape. Yeah. So even if someone didn't have time to come tonight, you can make multiple copies of the videotape. And when you go to a meeting with the chief executive officer, you give it to uh, Dr. Connor is an expert on the topic, but he, he, he's not from here, so he hasn't been really organizing. So that question is probably more better directed at us. We have contacted farmers, we've contacted the IFA, and we've been in contact with other uh, other industries as well. Now, some individual farmers are very concerned about this, especially one who's actually quite close to the factory. But 
they also are under pressure from the factory. And you also have the issue of uh, not wanting to admit there's a problem with a product you're selling. So one of the things, we mentioned the pressure we put on our studies, one is vote, but the other is consumers. You vote every day when you take you know, those colored bits of paper out of your pocket. So if, if they know that you won't buy it, if, if it's polluted, they increase their value and then pressure. Let them know as consumers that you're aware of this threat to the product and that you wouldn't choose to buy it elsewhere if, if it goes ahead. So back to that, we, we have tried to find out. If there are other people out there, because we're a small voluntary committee, if there are other people out there who have better connections in these industries than we do, you know, you're more than welcome to, to join in and, and try to help us influence them better. You know, otherwise it's, it's down to consumer power as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, Cal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cahill Crowes, my name, I'm a Care County Councillor. And uh, I've been asked by a few people uh, in the run to this this week to come in and speak. Um, I've been kept abreast of all of this by my friend Willie O'Dea and one or two people on the committee have been in touch with me also. And pollution doesn't follow county boundaries and the communities that I represent will be um, around the South Clare area right up to the city boundary. Uh, but if we take the communities of Cracklow and Melick, there's only a river separating them and with two or three kicks of a ball you're in Castle Mumbert, it's that close. So Castle Mumbert is the nearest community and Raheen and so on, but we would be quite close to two. And out in that area there's two uh, groups of feeling, there's the general apathy because I think we get tricked quite regularly that we have to come all the way to Condell Road and the Dock Road and go all the way out again. It feels quite peripheral at times, but then when you go on your phone and look at your Google Earth and, and zoom up, we're only a matter of fields away from this proposed incinerator. And it's very grave, and I think the, 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 the fallout from this and the airborne pollutants, as I said, will not follow county boundaries. Um, they, when they're, once they're airborne and in the sky, uh, they will be falling either by rain or by dust on fields and communities on both sides of the river. Uh, just a few short weeks ago, to maybe brief people in the room, we had a, a motion in Clare County Council uh, to take Limerick County Council to on board Plan Oil, which would have been unprecedented. And we were in the balance of having that vote just carried, and at the last minute it was amended. Uh, all was not lost. Clare County Council is currently preparing a large case file to take Limerick County Council and Irish Cement. Uh, we're going to drag them through with the Environmental Protection Agency, and we've never done that as a county council. Uh, the county council systems predate Irish independence. They're over 100 years old, and this has never happened before, but we're prepared to do it in Clare. Uh, it has been a proverbial two fingers to the people of Limerick what their own county council and land department did to them. And I'm speaking as someone who I, again, you could say I'm speaking from afar, and it's easy to speak when I'm uh, over the border in Clare. But I have seen, uh, you know, the two communities. We, we go over and across that border every day. Each one of us in the room does. And I have seen Limerick make huge strides forward. Their pitch for the city of culture, Limerick 2030, and into shoot into our city and county in the foot with this horrendous project. Um, so we are going to go the environmental protection agency route. We see this as very serious. There's a few things I just want to, by way of questioning, if that's okay at the end. Um, we have been told, and I, I've been briefed by someone in the last week, who has worked uh, most of his life on incinerators, the uh, hard engineering of them. And we have been told in Clare that Repack Ireland currently, if you go to any of the tire replacement uh, units around the city here, you would pay three euro per tire to have it recycled, and I think that goes to Repack Ireland. So the estimation we have been given is that uh, each tire that goes to Castle Mungert, it will first of all, it will bring the bill currently for coal and coal materials down to mill, and then they will bring them into a profit of about 24 million per annum. Uh, so it's not all about you know reducing carbon footprint and all, it's about driving huge profits. Now that's the prerogative of all companies, we don't dispute that. Uh, one thing I think would be very beneficial, and maybe the, the committee might take this on board, would be um, I'm a primary school teacher by day, and quite recently we were talking about the Chernobyl accident, and I'm not trying to equate the two because that would be alarmist. But uh, there's a fantastic picture in some of the school textbooks. And it has one of these, you could almost imagine it, a map and there's coloured circles which show the extent of the airborne pollutants. And I think for a few weeks, 
that should be if the committee could manage it in the Limerick Leader and Clare Champion to show people the extent that within a three kilometre range the pollutant factor will be 60 or 70 percent airborne and diluted downward from that and we've been hearing that the airborne pollutants of this will be in the air for a 30 kilometre radius so maybe the committee might just clarify some of that I'm trying to stoke up um, some response to this in Clare amongst the public, but as I began at the outset, there's a feeling of apathy and huge anger. But as a representative of the role in Clare, as the Clare County Council, we are on a head on, head on collision with Limerick County Council. We pass absolutely no apology. Uh, they give the two fingers to their own county people when they pass this decision. They had zero consultation with us across the river. And if there has to be a collision course, then so be it. It's in the public interest. Thank you. It's the wrong decider of, <laughs> I guess, uh, it's Jeff Beard.